So now, welcome to the Darcy Lecture. I'm Eileen Poder, and I would like you to introduce Mike Celia today. He uh, started his engineering career at Lafayette College and went on to Princeton to earn his MS and PhD degree. And from there, he went to be a professor at MIT, but it wasn't long before Princeton lured him back, and now he's the department head at their civil engineering department. He's done a lot of work in numerical modeling, and that has uh, led him to studies that ranged from looking at the conditions of water-stressed plants in sub-Saharan Africa, all the way up to looking at injecting carbon dioxide into the subsurface and evaluating its leakage. And that's what he's going to talk to us about today. He's going to look at geologic storage options for carbon mitigation. And so, Mike, if you'd like to take the, the mic here, uh, thank you so much for coming this afternoon. Well, uh, thank you, Eileen, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, I do want to start off by thanking uh, the Groundwater Association for uh, what was a spectacular year. Um, I'm sure in my career I will not have another year like this where I get to travel the world and talk about things that uh, I love to talk about um, and hear from all kinds of different groups. Uh, during this last year, I gave uh, one version or another of this lecture uh, 52 times um, with 53 visits to places. One place I had to visit twice because uh, I awoke to a blizzard that uh, closed down the university, so I had a second uh, trip. Uh, 28 of those lectures were in the US in 22 different states. And the remainder, which are 24 lectures, were outside the US. And that included lectures in uh, 12 different uh, countries across four different continents. So I really did have a chance to travel the world and uh, talk about flow and porous media. And it has been uh, absolutely terrific for me. And I'll repeat my thank you to the association. I've done my best to represent NGWA and all of you uh, well. All right, let me pull up the talk here and we'll get started. I'll start off with a couple of background slides. Just uh, I, I know that you all know about the Groundwater Association and I presume the Darcy uh, lectureship. Uh, but I would uh, always start off with a couple of introductory slides about the association, uh, always using this one as one of the group simply letting people know that this uh, series was established in 86, and since then, uh, many tens of thousands of individuals have heard some version <laughs> of, a, of a Darcy lecture. And I would also always use this one, which um, uh, I would use to make the point that groundwater is an important resource, and that the Groundwater Association, including its uh, Research and Education Foundation, is an important resource for groundwater studies. And I would follow that by encouraging everyone who wasn't a member to become a member of NGWA. I'm sure I don't need to do that here. <coughs> and then uh, I would go on to my talk, which I'll do now. Uh, so here you see the title of, uh, of the lecture. It's focused on geological storage of uh, carbon dioxide. And I'd like to use this title slide for two purposes. The first is to point out the list of collaborators. Uh, the first is Jan Nordbotten. Uh, Jan is a professor of mathematics at the University of Bergen in Norway. Uh, I first met Jan when he was a graduate student. Um, among other things, he's the youngest PhD in the history of the country of Norway. And uh, much of the mathematics that I will refer to, and some of which I'll show you in the talk, is a direct result of Jan's work. Uh, Stefan <coughs> Bachu and I have worked together for a number of years on carbon-related issues. Up until a few months ago, he was with the regulatory <coughs> agency uh, for oil and gas in the province of Alberta. He's since moved to an organization called the Alberta Research Council. And Sarah was a graduate student with me at Princeton. She's now doing a postdoc at the University of North Carolina. <laughs> the second thing I'll point out is that uh, uh, support for this work uh, has come from uh, an effort at Princeton that we call the Carbon Mitigation Initiative, which is a much larger effort than just the subsurface part that, uh, that I will speak to today. Um, and that is uh, supported jointly by BP and Ford Motor Company. Here's an outline of uh, what I'd like to cover in the talk. Um, I'll start off by giving a little bit of background information about the carbon problem uh, from a certain perspective in terms of sort of engineering challenges and options that we may have to deal with carbon issues. Uh, and that forms the first part of the talk. Uh, 
We'll think a bit about feasible solutions, and that will get us uh, uh, quite uh, quickly into the idea of geological storage. And then the second part of the talk really focuses on uh, geological storage, and uh, I, I will try to outline some of the approaches that we've used to look at some specific issues associated with, with CO2 injection. And those have to do with, uh, with risk of leakage. And that has led us to a, uh, a, a particular kind of uh, a modeling strategy that I will uh, attempt to explain and to illustrate uh, with a few selected examples. Um, we'll look at, uh, like I said, a couple of examples of field locations, and then we'll end up with some conclusions. All right, well, the carbon problem uh, can be summarized to some extent on this plot. This is a, a graph showing atmospheric CO2 concentration as a function of time over a thousand year time span. And what you see on this graph is that coming out of the last ice age, the atmosphere stabilized at about 280 parts per million of CO2 concentration and was stable for thousands of years uh, until the Industrial Revolution when you see the onset of this exponential increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration to the current value of about 385 ppm atmospheric concentration of CO2. Now we can put this into a, uh, a longer term perspective by looking at the entirety of ice core data that exists for uh, CO2 measurements, and that goes back uh, uh, many hundreds of thousands of years. And in those data, you see clear 100,000 year cycles of glacial interglacial periods where the interglacials will have maximum concentrations of CO2. But the interesting thing about the data set is that none of those maxima exceeds 300 parts per million uh, over this uh, essentially sort of million year time, time scale. The range is shown here of what's observed in the record. So uh, there are two things we can then say about, about the carbon problem. First is that we are collectively doing uh, what we might think of as a very interesting uh, uh, science experiment where we are increasing the concentration of, uh, of the greenhouse gas well beyond anything that is seen in the natural record, at least over sort of million year time scales and we are going to observe what happens to the Earth system. Right? We're doing that right now. <clears throat> the second thing that, uh, that we can say about the carbon problem is that it's likely that at some point in the future, we will collectively decide that we want to stop this experiment. And then the interesting engineering question is, how can we go about doing that? And that really is what drives uh, what I'll talk about in, in, in the remainder of this lecture. Well, if we want to think about uh, uh, what we can do to solve this problem, it's helpful to know where the CO2 comes from. This is a pie chart showing a source of CO2 uh, uh, by, by sector. And if uh, this is for global uh, 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 emissions, you see that the largest uh, slice of the pie comes from electricity generation. Second largest is from transportation, et cetera. If you looked at similar numbers for just the United States, you would see about 40% for, from uh, electricity production, and you would see about 32% from transportation. Either way, the two biggest slices of the pie are electricity and transportation, and I would submit that if you can't deal with those two slices of the pie, you'll have a lot of trouble solving the problem. So what does that mean? It means that we think about decarbonizing the power grid, and then probably using decarbonized electricity to think about how to reduce the remaining sectors of this pie. For example, uh, by using that thought process, one could then argue that it makes a lot more sense to think about electrifying the transportation sector as opposed to something like a hydrogen uh, economy where you have to put a whole new infrastructure in place, all right? <clears throat> Some numbers that are helpful. Uh, the latest estimate for global CO2 emissions, anthropogenic emissions, is for calendar year 2006, and that number was about eight and a half gigatons, 10 to the 15 grams of carbon per year. We'll use eight um, as a sort of current uh, level. You can convert that to CO2, and you get about 30 gigatons of CO2 by putting the two oxygens on. Now, most projections looking forward under uh, various kinds of business as usual scenarios uh, make the uh, uh, projection that over the next 50 years or so, the emission rate, unless we do something very drastic, is likely to double. We call that background doubling. All right, so that means that by the year 2058, we might expect this to go to 16 and this to go to 60. <clears throat> now, one of the things that's come out of the work, uh, the, the, the CMI work at Princeton, uh, is a concept 
that, uh, that's referred to as stabilization wedges. And I always find it useful to simply define what a wedge is because this concept of a wedge has now become part of the vocabulary in discussions of carbon mitigation. So uh, it's helpful to just get an idea of what it is. So uh, we'll, we'll do the definition by using this particular uh, graph. Here's time on this axis again. This is uh, emission rate on this axis with the numbers uh, corresponding to uh, uh, gigatons of CO2 per year. So we sit currently at 30 in the year 2008. If we look back 50 years, you see that over that time frame, we have increased emission rate by about a factor of five. And the background doubling that I mentioned implies that going out 50 years, we go up by a factor of two. That's this sort of current uh, business as usual uh, ramp here. Uh, I'll note parenthetically that if you were to look at the data from the last several years, you would probably be much more likely to think that the current rate uh, is much closer to background tripling than it is to background doubling. Uh, but maybe with the economic slowdown, we'll get back to background doubling. In any event, let's take this as a background, all right? Now, one of the things that groups like uh, IPCC and others like to do is to think about uh, alternate emission uh, scenarios going into the future and what those different scenarios mean in terms of climate change, all right? Um, one of the scenarios that we can think about is something called a flat path, which is exactly what it says. It says keep the, the current rate flat or fixed over the next 50 years. And if you do that and then you become a bit more aggressive, you find that climate will stabilize at a delta T of about three degrees C. Whether or not that's acceptable is a separate issue, okay, but that's what you would see. What would we need to do to get to the flat path instead of the current projection? Well, obviously we have to go from this curve down to this curve which means we have to find some way to avoid emitting all of the emissions associated with this green triangle, all right? So what my colleagues, uh, 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 Steve Pakala and Rob Sokolow, who are the co-principal investigators of the CMI project, uh, did was to say, look, let's take this and break it up into slices where each slice will increase by one gigaton of carbon per year after 50 years, all right, and call that a wedge. So that's a stabilization wedge. That means emission avoidance of 25 gigatons of carbon over a 50-year time period. If you have a technology that will give you that, you get credit for one wedge. And according to this diagram, if you want to follow the flat path, we need to find eight wedges worth of emission avoidance. All right? <clears throat> That's what the, the idea of a wedge is. Uh, also, a little bit of interesting history to this. When this paper was first published, four years ago now, the estimate was that we would need seven wedges. And when we first started the discussion, of this concept, uh, the first estimate was that we would need six wedges. So just in the span of a decade, we've essentially increased by two wedges. And we're gonna see on the next slide that each wedge corresponds to an enormous effort. So the implication is that the longer we delay, of course, the bigger the problem becomes by a large amount. Well, how do we get a wedge? <clears throat> Turns out that there are a number of existing technologies that will give you a wedge, or can give you a wedge. And here are seven that I decided to, uh, to put in a list. Um, let's take uh, nuclear, for example. Uh, if you took the current installed nuclear capacity around the world, added twice that amount, that would give you one wedge. And I invite you to think about the, the political challenges in trying to get that done. And if you do that, I would guess that you would conclude that out of nuclear, you couldn't get more than a wedge. All right? And what's interesting is that if you go down this list, what you'll see is that <coughs> each of these corresponds to an enormous effort to get you one wedge, but perhaps more importantly, none of them by themselves can give you eight wedges, which means you have to be <coughs> thinking about portfolios of technologies if you want to get to any reasonable solution to this problem. All right? Topic for today is number four. It says, uh, it says install carbon capture and storage, which we'll define on the next slide, at 800 large-scale coal-fired power plants. If you can do this, you get credit for one wedge, all right? <coughs> Why are we interested in CCS? There are many reasons, um, but uh, one of them is encompassed in this quote that I took from a report that came from a meeting uh, last year at MIT uh, on the future of coal, and it basically says that CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage, is the critical enabling technology if you want to both continue to use coal and do something about the carbon problem, all right? So right now, I think it's fair to say that that is essentially the only game in town. If we and China and India and, and, and others across 
across the globe, we're going to continue to use coal if we want to do something about CO2 emissions. CCS is where we need to look. The idea of carbon capture and storage is really quite simple. It is uh, based on the fact that we continue to use fossil fuels to power the electricity sector. We continue to use oil, gas, or coal, or some combination. That, by the way, um, will immediately lead to some opposition among what is now becoming fewer environmental groups, simply philosophically because they're opposed to continued use of fossil fuels. All right? uh, in any event, uh, you use the fossil fuel to produce your electricity either in the standard way or in modified uh, uh, power production that gives you easier uh, methods to capture the, the CO2. But the idea is that you have a capture facility that now becomes part of your, of your process where the CO2, instead of being vented to the atmosphere, is captured. And you take the captured CO2 and you put it someplace other than the atmosphere. And that leaves you with two <coughs> options. You can put it into the oceans or you can put it back underground. Right now, uh, it looks like underground is the much preferred option for a variety of reasons. Um, so that will be the topic of what we'll think about here. Uh, if we have this amount of CO2, which by the way is going to be an enormous quantity of CO2, um, but the options for where to put it include deep uh, saline aquifers, uh, uh, deep unminable coal seams, or depleted oil or gas reservoirs, either with enhanced oil recovery or without enhanced oil recovery. CO2 is sometimes used to drive enhanced oil recovery uh, uh, operations. We've got uh, 70 or 80 of these operations uh, in the US, for example, mostly in West Texas. Um, so you can think about depleted oil and gas uh, uh, or oil reservoirs with uh, uh, enhanced